Okay, so coming back to where we left, so we showed that the total energy for a dislocation can be given in the form E total equal to alpha g b square, where usually alpha varies between 0.5 to 1.5 and this is total energy. We also have a relation for just the elastic component. In the elastic component, you add a core component energy, core energy where the linear elasticity does not hold and usually this E core is less than 10 percent of the energy. Okay, so, now we have this relation for E total as a first order of approximation, we said that E total is equal to g b square. Now, what are the implications for this? There are some implications regarding dislocation, association and dissociation which we will see over here. This is called Frank's rule for dislocation reaction. What it is, uh, what this rule is basically describing is whether a dissociation reaction of dislocation is possible or a reassociation of dislocations are possible. What that means? Let us say we have uh, dislocations with three dislocations uh, with Berger vector B1, B2, B3, okay, and it is possible that B1 plus B2 can associate or dissociate into B3. Now, which one is possible is what we are trying to understand using Frank's rule. So, let us say if B 1 square plus B 2 square is greater than B 3 square, if it, this is something that you can know or derive, then what it means is that the overall energy for separately the two dislocations B 1 with the Berger vectors B 1 and B 2 is more than the energy for the dislocation for dislo uh, with Berger vector B 3 and therefore, they will have a tendency to associate and it will become uh, it will become B 3 the dislocation with Berger vector B 3. So, it will look, look like this. So, the B 3 square must be smaller than B 1 square plus B 2 square for this reaction to take place and this will be the association reaction. On the other hand, if you are a, if you can find out derive or it is given that B 3 square is greater than B 1 square plus B 2 square. It means that the overall energy which will be proportional to B 3 square for this dislocation B 3 with dislocation with Berger vector B 3 is higher than when the dislocations are separate individual as dislocations with Berger vector B 1 and B 2 and therefore, it will like to remain individual because that way the energy is lowered for the system and this will lead to a dissociation reaction. And it is uh, this part this particular dissociation would be very well known to you if you have had any course in mechanical behavior. You would know that uh, partials in FCC, partial dislocations in FCC type of system are formed by this dissociation. Here it is saying that smaller Berger vectors are energetically favorable. When we will come to the BCC and FCC lattices or uh, systems, you would see there are also examples where B 1 plus B 2 goes to B 3 meaning association reactions take place, uh, but the dissociation reaction is much more commonly known and that is for when a full dislocation in a FCC system dissociates into partials. Yeah, and there is another small aspect since we are talking about energy and uh, we said that what we have looked at is only the 
pure edge dislocation energy, pure screw dislocation energy. But we also said that at the same time that most of the dislocation would be in a mixed form. You will neither you will see only at a, at a particular point it will be either pure edge and at a particular point it will be pure screw. But on the whole it will remain a mixed dislocation. So, how do we find the energy and we showed that you can dissociate or you can find uh, resolve B into edge and screw components. So, the using that we will be able to find the energy of a mixed dislocation. So, using the same plot, so our topic here right now is energy of mixed dislocations. So, let us say the Berger vector is like this, which is at an angle theta and therefore, you have B which is perpendicular to the line vector which is somewhere over here and similarly, you have a B component of this, this is the real B, this is B perpendicular, this is B parallel. So, B parallel denotes the screw component because in screw dislocation vector and B perpendicular represents edge dislocation. And therefore, the elastic energy can be given as, so what is B uh, parallel equal to? This is equal to B cos theta, this is equal to B sin theta and therefore, we have G B square for the edge component, we can write it like this. So, this is the Berger vector for edge dislocation which is B sin theta. So, in taking square of it, it becomes B square sin square theta and rest of the components remain same and energy is uh, can be simply added. So, this is the uh, edge component energy, now we will add the screw component energy. If it were vector quantity or a tensor quantity, we would not be in a position to add it uh, directly like this. Thankfully, these are scalar quantities and we can simply add it. So, here B cos theta is the screw component and we will write the equation rest of it just like that. It will be equal to ln r by r naught and if you want to simplify it further, you can write it like this. So, what we see is that this E E L is a function of theta and why it should uh, why it is like that? Because screw dislocation and edge dislocation have different energy. If you remember we said that uh, elastic energy of screw dislocation is actually lower than the elastic energy of edge dislocation and assuming that nu is equal to 0.3, then we can get 0.33, then we get the factor as 0 0.66. So, uh, the energy of screw dislocation is 66 percent of the energy of edge dislocation, which would mean that a system, uh, if you take a material system, that then it would preferably like to have only the screw dislocation or it will like to have a higher dis density of screw dislocation, because that way it has lower energy. So, this is uh, the relation for E L and that is the, re the reason why energy elastic energy of dislocation or mixed dislocation will change with theta. So, if you go from one point to another point the energy per unit length is changing. So, with that we come to end for the energy component. Now, we will move to another aspect of dislocation which is motion of dislocation. So, our next topic is motion of dislocations. So, we have now looked at stress, strain, 
and energy components. Now, with these informations, we are equipped to understand a little about the motion of dislocation. And uh, we have not mentioned it earlier, but you would see that there are there can be two possible kind of motion for dislocations. One is called the glide motion, which is in the plane, and the other is the climb motion, which is perpendicular to the plane. So, in the glide motion, the uh, dislocation move uh, in the same plane in which the line vector and the Berger vector lies. The dislocation moves perpendicular to the plane which contains the Berger vector. It is only defined like that and the, uh, there will be implication of that, that there will be restriction on the planes on which this edge dislocation can move, while for screw dislocation it will have plenty of planes to move on to. Anyhow, coming back to motion of dislocation, the first aspect that we would want to study that we want to discuss here is glide force on dislocation. Now, assume that you have a material, let us say let me draw it like this, we are looking at a small section of it. Now, there can be external or internal load applied onto it. So, let us say this is the load. This load, if we are, since we are talking about uh, small section, this particular load which is shown by P, it could be arising because of some external load or it could also be arising because of some internal configuration. So, that is something we will leave it open right now. It can, so, whatever we derive will be independent of whether this load that is coming onto this is from external load or internal load. Now, let us say that there is a particular plane on which a dislocation is moving. So, let us say the dislocation is So, let us say this red line denotes the dislocation and over here it must have Berger vector which will be constant throughout. So, let us say the Berger vector is like this. So, this is the Berger vector. Now, this Berger vector also denotes the slip direction. So, the shear stress must be resolved along this Berger vector to find out how much stress is acting on this dislocation which will cause its motion. So, let us say the resolved shear stress is given by this tau and you see that I have uh, drawn it parallel to B. So, the resolved shear stress from sum of external and internal load is coming out to be tau. Next, let us say that the area onto which this shear stress is acting is area is equal to A. Now, what we will do is we will see a in a zoomed direction how this dislocation is moving. So, let us say this is the dislocation that we drew, this is the Berger vector and this was the dissolved tau and let us say this, this is the new position for the dislocation. Since it is not appearing here, let me draw it by. Okay. Now, let us consider a small length d l and let us say it has moved a small distance d s. So, we are look talking about now the average shear displacement of crystal by glide of this segment d l can be given as average shear displacement of crystal. So, we are talking about this crystal which is the section uh, shown over here by glide and since it is moving only by glide we are assuming that the dislocation is moving in the plane of segment d l by a distance d s this will be given by. So, this uh, del divided by area a because this is where the shear stress is acting and multiply it with Berger vector v to normalize it. Now, since this is the shear displacement, 
So, what will be the work done? Work done will be some force which has acted onto this into this displacement. So, this is uh, let us say delta s force into delta s is equal to and what is this force? Force is nothing but shear stress acting on the area A. So, this is force and delta s is d s into d l by A into B. Now, this is the total work done. So, the glide force if we want to talk about the uh, force which was acting on to the dislocation, then we have glide force on a unit length of dislocation, it can be defined as work done when unit length of dislocation. So, we have to talk about a unit per unit length, uh, the force will be calculated as force per unit length, that is the general norm when we are whenever we are talking about dislocation, because dislocations are long lines, we cannot uh, calculate the total force, we can only calculate force per unit length. When unit length of dislocation moves unit distance. So, the force can be what it means is that the uh, force will be equal to work divided by unit length divided by the unit displacement. So, this comes out to be tau into b and now this is a very important relation. So, this is telling us how much force is acting on the dislocation. So, far we were talking in terms of shear stress which is acting only along Berger vector. However, now we have boiled down to force that is acting on to the dislocation which means when we are and the dislocation since it is moving in normal direction. So, this force will also be acting normal to the dislocation. So, we are have come down to a quantity force which is acting on the dislocation in the normal direction and it is given by shear stress times the Berger vector B. Now, what is the meaning of this? If we have let us say a dislocation like line like this and let us say this is the Berger vector, similarly this is the tau. So, shear stress and Berger vector are acting in this particular direction. However, the force that we are talking about which is equal to tau times B this is acting normal to the dislocation. So, here are here we have the relation F equal to tau B, where tau is the resolved stress which we can easily find from the given condition with where it is from the internal stresses or from the external stresses and from that we can say how much force is acting on per unit dislocation length and that will be just shear stress times B. So, this is a bit very powerful relation which gives us uh, the force that has to be acting. Now, you have to also realize that this force that we are talking about is actually a imaginary quantity. What is really uh, applied here is only stress. So, force you must keep in mind is a imaginary quantity. This is only useful from the point of view of uh, understanding how the dislocations are getting moved. The real quantity is tau. So, if you look at here tau is like this, but that would mean that the dislocation are moving like this. So, the dislocation is moving even direction in direction uh, which is perpendicular to tau or maybe even uh, inverse of tau, because as long as there is a resolved stress along Berger vector, 
there will be force acting normal to the dislocation. This is the implication of this relation. The only time when a resolved stress will not be able to move a dislocation is when tau itself will not be, per, uh, when tau itself is perpendicular to B. So, when tau is perpendicular to B, no force implies no motion of dislocation. But as soon as you get the tau some resolved stress along the Berger vector, then what it is also doing is that even if your let us say a Berger, uh, your dislocation is like this with Berger vector like this, this as if the Berger vector is like this, this is meaning tau is like this. Now, in this particular case the dislocation, the dislocation can expand depending on the sign. If the tau is in the same sign, the dislocation will expand. So, if you see the dislocation is moving in the direction opposite to the shear applied shear stress. Why? Because as long as there is tau along B, there is force acting on the dislocation. On the other hand, if the tau was in the opposite direction like in the inverse direction, then it would have probably been contracting the dislocation. So, that is something that we learn here that tau has to be resolved along Berger vector B. However, force is acting normal to dislocation line. Implication that dislocations can move in opposite direction to tau. Okay, so, hopefully this has uh, given you enough understanding to relate tau to B and this tau can be coming from any of the like we said it could be from external uh, stresses or it could be from internal stresses. For example, there could be bunch of dislocations because of which there is stress getting generated and from there there is tau getting applied onto the, this particular dislocation. So, here uh, this tau we have not um, said whether it is it has to be whether it can uh, it has to be external or internal it can be any of these things. Okay, so, now let us uh, move on to you know, regarding the dislocation motion. So, now that we know f there is a f equal to tau b relation there is another implication for this which is in terms of line tension. Now, first of all why should there be a line tension in a dislocation? Line tension exists because dislocation has energy. Now, if dislocation has energy, it implies that if you increase the length of dislocation, then what happens to energy? Then energy, energy also increases, which implies that it or it can be viewed as that work has uh, work needs to be done to increase the length because when you do work then energy will get added and therefore, the line dislocation length can increase. And therefore, this can be viewed as line tension. So, now that uh, we have defined this let us look at one particular uh, application of this line tension which is to describe how much shear stress would be required if you are if you want 
the line tension or sorry the dislocation line to have some certain curvature let us say radius r. So, let us draw a line dislocation. So, let us say the line dislocation is like this. So, we it has some curvature in a we are drawing we have zoomed in to a very very small length. Okay. So, this is a very small length of dislocation that we are talking about and the overall uh, you can assume that the overall theta is very small over here. So, we are talking about a very small length which is d l and the theta is also small. So, this is d theta and there as there is a energy associated with this location line. So, there will be line tension acting like this which will be along the line direction let us say at the edges of this um, small segment of dislocation that we are looking at which means that since there is tension here tension here therefore, there will be net tension in this direction. And if there is uh, net tension in this direction and if you still want to keep this curvature which has okay, we have I have not mentioned the radius it is radius is if it is still wants to maintain this curvature then there must be some applied stress down out which will be um, along the Berger vector of course and this is the net tension. Now, first of all let us see what do we know. We know that this tension or the force is equal to alpha g v square. How do we know that? We know that because energy what uh, this was earlier defined as what energy per unit length and what is energy per unit length? Energy per unit length is equal to force. So, the tension that is acting along the dislocation segment along this direction and along this direction can be written as alpha g b square. So, now, now we have one relation other relation is there is a net force acting like this and therefore, a uh, balancing st uh, stress must act along this direction and what is that net force here? If this is T then you can find out that this is this angle would be d theta by 2 this would also be equal to d theta by 2 and therefore, this will become 2 to 2 t sin d theta by 2 equal to tau naught b d l where do we get this right hand side. Now, this is the force here acting here over here we should have total force. Now, this is what is this force per unit length. If this is the shear, tau naught is the shear stress then this becomes the uh, shear stress times Berger vector this, this becomes force per unit length times length therefore, this is the total force quantity. So, this is the force that is balancing in the other direction and this is the uh, tension because of the line tension of the dislocation. So, using these two relation we would be able to see we will come back to the next in the next lecture, but what you will see is we should be able to get a relation like this. So, what I would suggest is that you try and uh, uh, obtain this how to get this relation and uh, we will come back and I will show you how to come to this relation.